Good morning. Um, I have a, a nice surprise for you today. I have a visitor from um, a, a machine learning company, a practitioner. Uh, and I asked him to give you a little presentation at the end uh, about um, some problems of using machine learning in industry and what it looks like. Uh, but I will introduce him uh, properly later. Uh, for now, I want to talk about EM. So I'm switching topics a little bit because I want to make sure I cover this. Um, if you remember, last few weeks we were talking about uh, directed graphical models and undirected graphical models, and we went through the computational complexity of inference and of parameter estimation and of structure estimation. And <coughs> one of the things I mentioned in multiple places is that, oops, this requires EM. And we didn't talk about what EM is. So um, what EM is, is all about maximum likelihood estimation, okay? We basically learned one big methodology for parameter estimation called maximum likelihood. Uh, we did that a long time ago. And here is a reminder of the maximum likelihood principle or the way you derive maximum likelihood estimation. You write down the likelihood function of your data. Data would typically would be x1 through xn. And you look at the likelihood function as a function of the parameters, theta, not as a function of the data. The data is fixed. The parameters are what varies here. And then you ask yourself, what value of the parameters give this function its maximal value? And these are the maximum likelihood estimates for this particular family that you're searching over. And maximum likelihood estimation has many nice properties. It's not ideal. Sometimes we prefer other things. But it has generally very nice properties, especially asymptotic properties, as you have more, more and more data. Um, I gave you several examples of maximum likelihood estimation. I think one of them was a binomial distribution, where we derived the result that um, the maximum likelihood estimate for probability of head is the fraction of the time you got head. Not very surprising. Also not surprising, example of estimating a Gaussian mean where the standard deviation is known from xi data. So the data is the x1 through xn that were derived supposedly independently from this Gaussian. Uh, we set up the problem. It's a single parameter mu, argmin, I'm sorry, argmax, argmax. Here's the likelihood according to the Gaussian. The sigmas are fixed. The mu is the unknown, the xi is fixed. And if you remember, we went through a whole bunch of uh, um, steps. We simplified by getting rid of um, parameters of constants that don't change with the maximization. Then we took the log, then we got rid of some more things. Uh, then we took the derivative, equated to zero, solved it. And the solution ended up being this which again is not surprising, it's the sample average. So we prove that the sample average, which is a very reasonable, intuitively reasonable estimate for the true mean, uh, we prove that that is the maximum likelihood estimate of the true mean. Okay? This is all by the way of reminding you. Now let's go to a more difficult example and see where we get stuck and what we can do about it. So the more, exam more difficult example I'm going to give you is a mixture of two Gaussians. You have two Gaussians. They both have some fixed known standard deviations. Let's assume for simplicity that they're both the same standard deviation. And your data is generated by every data point. You first choose randomly between the two Gaussians. And then once you chose the Gaussian, you draw a point from that Gaussian. And the choice between the two Gaussians is also very is uniform, so 50-50. So it's the simplest possible setting of a mixture of Gaussians. I'll repeat that. You're going to draw 100 points. For every point, you first flip a fair coin to choose whether to draw from Gaussian A or Gaussian B. If the coin landed on A, you draw from Gaussian A. If it landed on head, you draw on Gaussian A. Otherwise, you draw from Gaussian B. And these are the points that you drew in this process. Now, you drew those points, so you may have recorded how the coin landed. So you may know which point came from Gaussian A, which point came from Gaussian B. Somebody else may only see these data points, 
and may not know which Gaussian they came from. We're going to solve the maximum likelihood uh, estimation under both of these conditions. First, let us assume that you know which point came from which Gaussian. I'm going to capture this information in a little table here with some random variables <coughs> called z i well, let me call it directly j here and uh, so this is z i 1, sorry and this is z i 2 um, the Gaussians in general would be called Gaussian mu 1 and mu 2 I don't know where they are exactly these Zij's are indicator random variables. They take on only two values, 0 and 1. And the interpretation is very simple. Zi1 is 1 if point Xi was generated by Gaussian 1. And it's 0 otherwise. So if I knew that this came from Gaussian 1, this would be 1 and this would be 0. If I knew that this came from Gaussian 2, this would be 0 and this would be 1. So in fact, throughout the set of points, for each one of them, 1 is 0 and 1 is 1. So let's say this is 1, 0, and 1, and 0, and 1, and 0, and whatever it is here, it tend to be 1 here. And this has to come from somewhere, so I say this is what it is. So this is my indication of which point came from each Gaussian. And now the maximum likelihood solution um, is fairly simple. I separate the data points into the, which Gaussian they came from, and I apply this to each one of them separately. So the likelihood function is separable, and I'm going to estimate each mean by the sample mean of the points from which uh, that came from it. So the solution would be mu1, this hat means estimate, maximum likelihood, is going to be the mean of all the points for which there is one here. Now I'm going to take advantage of the notation I created with disease to write the solution in a somewhat generalized form. I'm going to sum over all the data points. I goes from 1 to n. I'm going to sum the data just like here. But I'm going to modulate it by the indicator variable. So this is going to be z i 1. So for those data points that were not generated by this Gaussian, it'll be 0. And then I'm going to normalize by the same zij, zi1. And this, of course, is simply the number of points that were generated by Gaussian 1. And this is true for mu1 and for mu2. So I'll write it in general, muj, zij, zij here, for every j goes from, zero, from 1 to 2. So this is just a fancy way of writing, separating the points, separate the points into two groups according to which Gaussian generated them, and then calculate the sample mean in each group. So far, pretty easy. Now let's consider the case where you don't know which data point Gen came from which Gaussian? All you're given is the axis, not the z's. All you see is a bunch of points in a real line generated. And you're still trying to derive a maximum likelihood estimate for both means, mu1 and mu2. Where do you think these means are? Just by looking at this picture. 
Yeah, there's a cluster here, there's a cluster here. Chances are one mean is somewhere around here, and one mean is somewhere around here. So it might look something like this, and like this. Um, yeah. Because they're both the same standard deviation, their height would be the same, their width would be the same. Um, now suppose these were the true means, which we don't know. Could be a little bit aside, but suppose these were the true means. Will you be able to derive from that which data point came from which Gaussian? No. Like this data point, which Gaussian do you think it came from? You won. So you can't be 100% sure, but you can be pretty confident given how far out it is that, you know, it could have come from, from you too, but at this point, this one is so low, you can't even see it, right? It drops very quickly to zero. Same for this one. What about this point? Close to 50-50. You know, it could have come from either, right? So we don't know where the mu's are. If we knew where the mu's are, we still would not know which, for certainty which point came from which side. But we could make probabilistic statements about these points. For example, we could say that this point is extremely likely to have come from u1. This one is extremely likely to come from u2. And this one is somewhere in between. And we can actually make that very quantitative um, by comparing the heights here. The height of this Gaussian and the height of the second Gaussian. And it looks to me like this Gaussian is about, this height is about three times as big as this one. So if, if this was an uh, accurate drawing and these were the correct means, uh, I would say that it's three times more likely that the data point came from this Gaussian than it did from that Gaussian. I can compare the heights of, these, of the bars. And in fact, if I compare the height of the bar here, I will find the ratio extremely large because this one drops to zero so fast. <coughs> Let me start by trying to solve now the maximum likelihood um, uh, problem using the simple formula I have there. To solve it using this formula, I need to f start by writing down the likelihood function. What is the likelihood function that describes this process? We can think about it as the generative process that has two steps. One step is draw an indicator, draw j, from a binomial distribution with half, or Bernoulli distribution with half. Namely, flip the coin to get j equals 1 or j equals 2. Right? That's the decision of which Gaussian to draw from next. And once the, we got this j, it's either, either 1 or 2, then we use that to draw a data point xi from the Gaussian with the mean sub j and the fixed standard deviation. And this process is repeated many, many times, n times, independently each time. You decide which Gaussian to draw from by flipping a fair coin, and then based on your decision, based on that decision, whether it's j equals 1 or j equals 2, you draw from the appropriate Gaussian. I can take this um, generative picture and convert it into a likelihood function. The likelihood of a particular data point xi, given <coughs> all the parameters of the model, which is mu1, which in, in general we don't know, mu2, and sigma squared, can be written as if you flip a coin, there's a 50% chance that it will end on head, and that therefore you will be choosing j equals 1. So this is a 50%, 1 half. And if that happens, there is some probability of the point xi coming from, Gauss, from uh, some probability according to which that point was derived from the first Gaussian. That would be 1 over 2 pi sigma 0 e to the xi minus mu 1 squared over 2 sigma 0 squared. This is one branch, one possibility. 
So you have to be lucky with the probability of one half of landing on that side and then generating that point from there. But the point could also have been generated by the coin falling on the other side. So that would be plus another half times the likelihood according to the second Gaussian. So this would be xi minus mu2 squared over 2 sig sigma 0 squared. So the di only difference between this part and this part is the mu1 here versus mu2 here. The halves have to do with a fair coin. If the coin was not fair, we would have some other values there. This is the likelihood function for generating a single data point xi. Now we need to write the likelihood function for generating the entire sample of n data points. I'm not going to rewrite everything, I'm just going to modify it here. Under assumption of independence, the likelihood is the product of the likelihood of the individual data points. I'll write it here, L of x1 through xn given mu1, mu2, and sigma0. Compare that to this. Very similar product, but here it's a product of just this one term. There's a single mu. Here it's a product of a sum of two terms. If you remember, our next step was to get rid of constants that don't matter to the maximization and try to simplify and then take the log and simplify again and take derivative. Remember all these steps? Let's try to do that here. I can actually do it quite nicely. This half and this part is identical between these two. Question? E to the negative, thank you. Did I miss it in other places? No, okay, thank you. This part is identical to this part. So they can be taken out of the addition with distributive law, and then they can be taken out of the multiplication because they don't depend on i. And then if I want to find the arg max here over mu1 and mu2, so this is joint maximization over two parameters, um, they won't matter. So these could go out. So this becomes mu1, mu2, this is a vector. It's the maximum likelihood joint estimation of two parameters is the argmax over all joint values of mu1, mu2 of the product, i goes from 1 to n, of the following sum, e to the negative xi minus mu1 squared over 2 sigma 0 squared plus e to the negative xi minus mu2 squared over 2 sigma 0 squared. Our unknowns here are the mu1 and mu2. Everything else is known. So I simplified. What should I do next? I can't simplify any further. Yeah? Yeah, take the log. Okay. 
what happens if I take the log? I can still stay with the same arg max, right? Because log is a monotonically increasing function. Arg max over the u thing. And the log turns this into a sum. I goes from 1 to n. And then sum of the log of these. So this becomes sum of log of this. Log of this sum. Right? e to the negative something plus e to the negative something. Now what? Sorry? Take the derivative, OK? Uh, I should take the derivative, two partial derivatives, one with regard to mu1, one with regard to mu2, set them both to 0. So I will end up with two equations, two constraints, uh, for two parameters. Um, what happens when I take the derivative? So you can push the derivative inside here. And then you have to take the derivative of the log, which is 1 over this expression, uh, times the internal derivative here. You can try it. Try it at home. Um, the bottom line is that we don't end up with an analytical solution. We don't have a way to solve this equation. It becomes a, it's a complicated equation. So when we give you the maximum likelihood estimate or maximum likelihood principle, there was no guarantee it can always be applied. Sometimes the likelihood function is easy to maximize. Sometimes it's not. And this is a case where it's not. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a maximum, but it means that we don't know of a way to solve it analytically by simplifying and equating, you know, taking derivative, equating to zero, and isolating the parameters. And this is one case where we don't know how to do that. So the maximum likelihood solution may still exist, but we don't know how to calculate it in one step. What we're going to do is try to arrive at the maximum likelihood solution indirectly through iterations. This is a long history in math. You know, you're familiar with newton raphson method of finding zeros of functions. You know, sometimes you can write an equation, um, something equals zero, and you can solve it analytically. Other times, you cannot solve it analytically, but you can go through an iterative procedure, uh, a numerical uh, calculation that gets you closer and closer and kind of guarantee to converge to it. So. All of this is by way of motivating why we need the EM algorithm. The EM algorithm is designed to give us a maximum likelihood estimate of parameters when we cannot derive them analytically, when we cannot use math to solve the equation and come up with an analytic closed form solution. When does that happen? It happens when some of the process that we um, are modeling is hidden from us or latent. Or unobserved. I'll just yell as I usually do. Can you hear me over there? OK. <laughs> EM is for deriving maximum likelihood estimates non-analytically. Namely, when you cannot derive them analytically, when you don't have a closed form solution. And that is often needed on several conditions. 
One condition is when, as I described before, the process that generated the data included steps that are not visible to you. So in the case of the mixture of Gaussians, the step of flipping the coin and seeing the answer, if, it's, if you don't see the answer of the coin, you just see the final result, often you find yourself in a situation where you cannot uh, de uh, derive the maximum likelihood solution analytically. So we call that a situation of latent variables. Which are the latent variables in our example? Louder, please. Z. Zs are latent. If they're not latent, if you have them, you don't need to go through all of that. You have this solution, right? So in our case, Z, and in fact, Z are, is the common way we denote latent variables. Another case uh, is if the dog ate some of your data. You have a table of data, complicated measurements and something, and your dog came and <laughs> ate some of it. Um, then some of it is missing. When you have some of the data missing, the likelihood function can become very complicated because you have to sum over all possible missing data with some probability. So the two main cases to think about is latent variables or missing data. Of course, they're kind of the same thing. You can say that Z is the missing data. Now, I will show you the way the EEM algorithm works for this particular example, and I will then generalize to more general cases. Let me emphasize that EEM, even though it's called the EEM algorithm, it is not actually an algorithm. It is rather a recipe for trying to derive algorithms. And depending on the specific likelihood function that you have, either you can derive it or you can't derive it. So there's no guarantee that the EM will work in your case. Um, sometimes you try to apply it and you get stuck, just like the general maximum likelihood estimation formula. You can, this explanation, this um, formulation is very clear, but it doesn't mean you can solve it. It doesn't mean you can find the argmax. Let me do it for this particular case. This is going to be an iterative procedure. I'm going to start the iteration by choosing two tentative values for the means, some values. So it's going to be the init st step is mu1, some value. Choose choose mu1 and mu2. These values are going to be updated. They're going to be iterated over and changed. So I'm going to indicate which iteration I'm in with a superscript right here. I'm now in iteration 0. Which values should we use? What would you choose? Any suggestions? What would be a reasonable choice? Sorry? You have a bunch of data points. You have to start with some guess as to where the means are. Yeah? Something like that. I mean, you could maybe divide the points into the a left part and the right part and find the mean of, both, of either, that would be run one reasonable heuristic. You don't want to start with both mu's here, right? You could. The algorithm would still work to an extent, but it doesn't make sense to start over there. Or you don't want to start with one mean over there and one mean over there. Again, you could. The only thing you shouldn't do is choose the two means to be identical. If you do, the algorithm would never be able to separate them. So let's just say that they're not identical. Now let me give you the intuition behind how the algorithm works. The algorithm takes the tentative values you assign to the means and draws these Gaussians just the way I drew them. And then it goes to each data point and it calculates the ratio of those heights to determine the probability that 
this one particular data point came from the first Gaussian versus the second Gaussian, conditioned on the current values of the means. So it depends on where the means are. But for a fixed assumed value of the means, you can calculate these heights, you can calculate the ratios between them, and that gives it the posterior probability that this data point came from that Gaussian. I say posterior because it's based on seeing the data and knowing the means. <coughs> probability that xi came from Gaussian 1 conditioned on, I should add, conditioned on mu 1 and mu 2 is a zero iteration. Well, let's make it more general now, the lth iteration. I'm now in iteration L. Condition on specific values of mu1 and mu2 and on the known standard deviation is calculated as the ratio of these heights, which is e to the negative xi minus mu1 of iteration L squared divided by 2 sigma squared divided by the denominator, which is the two of them together. So it's, it's this height divided by the sum of both heights. So the two together would look like this. This is the same as here, negative xi minus uh, mu1 L squared over 2 sigma squared plus the height of the second bar, which is e to the negative, the same thing, xi minus mu2 squared, and this is mu of iteration L, divided by 2 sigma squared. All I wrote here is the ratio of one bar to the sum of the two bars. And this gives me, if these mu's were correct, if the means were correct, and knowing that the two Gaussians are equal probability a priori, a fair coin, then this gives me the posterior probability after having seen xi that it came from Gaussian 1. I'm going to write it a slightly different way. This is the probability that zi1 equals 1. Remember zi1? zi1 is uh, the random variable that captures whether or not a data point i came from Gaussian 1. There's a useful uh, property of indicator random variables, those that take on only value 0 or 1. Their probability of being 1 is the same as their expectation. What is an expectation of this random variable? It's 1 times the probability of it being 1 plus 0 times the probability of being, it being 0. So it's basically the probability of it being 1. So I now gave you an expression for the zij. I should qualify it. I should continue to say here this is conditioned on the specific values of mu. Instead of writing both mu1 and mu2, I'll just write the, the vector of mu's of iteration L. Ah. So what I did in this step is I calculated, since I don't know the z's, this is the critical point, I don't know the, la the latent variable zi1, zi2. But given some tentative values of the parameters, I can ex calculate their expectations. That is the critical point. I don't know them, but I can calculate the expectation conditioned on some value of the parameters. I do that for all the i's. I do it for every i. And of course, I do it for zi2, not just for zi1, for, for both of the components. And then I go back to my 
simple equation, the one that I could use, could afford to use, if I had the z values. And what I'm going to do now is take each z value, which I don't have, and substitute for it the expected value of the z value. So my the one step um, EM in this case is mu 1 of iteration L plus 1 is going to be equal to this expression, but every zi is, is replaced by its expectation under the current mu values. Sum over i goes from 1 to n. Expectation of zi1 condition on mu of iteration L. times xi, and here I have the same thing but without the xi. i goes from 1 to n, expectation of z i1 conditioned on the mu vector of iteration L, um, compare this to this, and I do it, you know, I can call this j, so I do it for one and I do it for two. J here and J here. J goes from one to two. Same formula, but I use expectations as opposed to the real values because I don't have the real values. One intuitive way of thinking about it is that given the tentative values that I chose for the means, for the mu's, I take each data point and it's as if I fractionate it, as if I break it into two fractions. If this data point was three times more likely to have come from here than from here, then I take three quarters of this data point and assign it as if it came from this Gaussian, and I take one quarter of it and assign it as if it came from this Gaussian. And now, what this formula does, you can think about these expectations as fractions of data points. It does a weighted average for each mean, weighted by its fractions. So it's as if we're saying to recalculate a, more, a better estimate from U2, we take all the data points and estimate their mean, but each one only a fraction of it that we ascribe to this, to this Gaussian. So this data point, almost all of it, 0.9999 of it, Will, count, will be calculated, will be part of this calculation. But this data point, only three quarters of it will be part of this calculation, and this data point, only a tiny negligible part of it would be part of it. We take the data points and we fractionate them and we assign one fraction to one mean and one fraction to the other mean. And then we estimate based on the fractions, the individual means. So this is how we derive the L plus one estimates based on the L estimates. This is the recursive step. Questions so far? Is this, yeah, go ahead. Ah, wonderful. That's exactly what I was gonna ask. Is this algorithm guaranteed to converge? No. Why not? Which might not be bounded? Something might not be bounded. <laughs> okay. <remember> right. <laughs> this is a good time to plug my other course. All right. <laughs> okay. Before I forget, yeah, let me plug my other course. So I teach another course. It's called Language and Statistics. It is actually more about statistics than about language, but it's about the kind of statistics that are, is needed when process in language technologies, like when you build language models, natural language processing, computational linguistics, all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
its overlap with the content of this class is, I would say, about, I don't know, 15% or something. There may be two topics that are overlap, but we do them at a deeper level there. Uh, it is um, available both at the PhD level and at the master's level. These are the two numbers. Uh, I teach it in the fall only, so you'll have to wait. And if you are here still next year, um, and there are undergrads who take it as well. Uh, we might even create a separate track for them, but they've been taking it for years without a problem. End of plug. Okay, so let's go back to, um, does this algorithm converge? It turns out this particular algorithm does converge. Um, but let me tell you what the EM algorithm guarantees in general, and then we'll see when it converges and when it doesn't. So this is just one special case of EM. In general, EM guarantees, if you're able to, to apply it, it guarantees the following. It guarantees that no matter where you started, what your initial choice of the parameters are, if you calculate the likelihood based on that initial choice, and then you calculate the likelihood based on the rederived parameter values after applying this once, the likelihood, the, the, the likelihood based on the rederived or re-estimated parameters is going to be no lower and typically higher than the likelihood based on the original estimate. So it guarantees that the likelihood of the data, which is fixed, given um, your parameters in general, iteration L plus 1, is going to be greater than or equal the likelihood of the data given the parameters of iteration L. That's the only thing it guarantees. That as you go through it and you move from iteration to L to iteration L plus 1, the likelihood of the data that you use for your training is not going to go down. It's only going to go up. So you start with I'll just call this L of iteration L and this L of iteration L plus 1. Uh, you start with L of iteration 0, and then you move to L of iteration 1, and L of iteration 2, and L of iteration 3, and you can keep iterating, and you are building a sequence of likelihoods that is guaranteed to be non-decreasing. Strictly speaking, this is the only thing that EM guarantees. Now, if you can also show that the likelihoods of the data under any set of parameters is bounded, now you have a non-decreasing sequence that is bounded from above. And those of you who took calculus may remember that a non-decreasing infinite sequence that is bounded will converge. So you're right. Um, to show that the algorithm will converge, you need to also show that the likelihood is bounded. Is the likelihood bounded in our case? So the likelihood function is right here. Um, no better start with this one because we have all these parts that we crossed out. So the likelihood for any value of mu1 and mu2 is a product of the likelihood of each data point. So if each data point is bounded, the product is bounded. Is each data point bounded? Well, these are fixed numbers. And these are fixed numbers. Is this part bounded? The only free parameters there is the mu1, right? As you move mu1 around, can you make this, this expression arbitrarily large? You cannot. Why not? The highest value is achieved when mu1 equals xi, in which case this is 0, and e to the 0 is 1. This is a, the same thing as arguing informally that if you have a Gaussian, its height is bounded 
as long as the standard deviation is fixed. If you're trying to estimate at the same time, not just the mean, but also the standard deviation, you have to consider Gaussians that are very, very thin and therefore very high. And in fact, if you allow the standard deviation to go arbitrarily close to zero, you're effectively allowing the height of the Gaussian at its peak to go arbitrarily close to infinity, if there is such a thing. So are Gaussians bounded? The question is, it the answer is, it depends. For a fixed standard deviation, or for a standard deviation that's bounded away from zero, the answer is yes. When standard deviation is not bounded away from zero, the answer is no. In our case, we assume there is a fixed standard deviation. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's fixed. Therefore, the Gaussians are bounded. Therefore, the likelihood is bounded. And therefore, the EM algorithm is guaranteed to converge. What will it converge to is the next question. Will it converge to the maximum likelihood estimate? The answer is no. It'll converge to a local maximum likelihood estimate. So if um, I draw, this is a little bit like a gradient descent in the sense that it finds a maximum, but not, go not guaranteed to find the global maximum. If the uh, likelihood function, the likelihood function here is in two dimensions, mu1 and mu2, so it'll be hard for me to draw it, but I will draw just informally in one dimension. If you have something like this as the likelihood function and you're trying to find the maximum, which we know is here, you may end up there or you may end up here, or you may end up here. If you were to run um, gradient descent, then it would be very clear to you if you start here, that you end up here and not there. Or if you start here, that you end up here and not here. With EM, it's not so clear because the steps are not local. So you could start from here and take a step and end up here and then another step to here and then to here. That could very well happen. So it's harder to know um, even in a simple case of one dimensional landscape. This is more like uh, newton raphson again, if you're familiar with that, when you take big steps, big correction steps. So like gradient descent, this is an iterative procedure, and it's only guaranteeing you a local maximum. Unlike gradient descent, it takes big, not local steps. Big steps, which means it'll converge much faster than gradient descent. Gradient descent can take thousands of iterations to converge, or more. EM will typically converge in 10 iterations. Again, it all depends on how many parameters you have and so forth, but it will converge in a relatively small number of parameters. Question? So in the case of the two Gaussians, are the two local maxima just mu1 and mu2 and then switch? Uh, good question. Good question. Uh, are there re is there real beyond the switching of the things? I think I'm not so sure about two, but if you have more than two, the answer is definitely not. It's not just up to permutation of the naming. There are actually different solutions. I'm not 100% sure about two. I think even with two, I think even with two you might have different solutions. I guess what I'm saying is, in the, in the case right. of the Gaussians, how could EM ever produce anything other than U1 and U2 where they're at on the board or flipped? Like, what would the other solution? Well, in the case of the um, data points that I gave you, there may be only that solution, but other data points may be more. Yeah. Yeah. There's no step size to adjust in the M. The, the rule is very simple. You take um, the formula that you would have used as a one-step formula if you knew the Z's, and you replace each z with its expectation conditioned on the current value of the parameters. No adjustment. Again, this, in this regard, it's like newton raphson It's like some of the numerical uh, methods for finding zeros of functions, iterative procedures. Question? Wonderful question. What would be the stopping criteria for the number of iterations? 
I can think of two stopping criteria. One of them is um, look at the parameters, parameter values, and look how they change. And when they start changing very, very little, decide to stop. The second stopping criteria I can think is keep track of the likelihood function. Watch to make sure as it goes up and up and up. It never goes down. If it goes down, you have a bug in your implementation. It goes up and up, and, but then how much it goes up, you know, goes down, and then when it barely goes up, you stop. Which one is better? The second one is better. It's safer. I'll tell you why. It is possible that the likelihood will converge, namely that the in increases in it are going to be exponentially small, and yet that the parameters themselves will not converge. Let me uh, try to give you an example of that. Imagine that you're searching a two-dimensional space, as in the case here with u1, u2, and the likelihood function has the shape of a mountain that had its top blown off by an explosion. So here's the mountain. And here's the top. It was blown off, so it's completely flat. All right, let me tell you what the parameters are. The parameters are... This is mu1, and mu2 goes into the board. So you're searching in this space, and this direction is the likelihood function. You're trying to find the, the likelihood. Where is the maximum likelihood? At the top of the mountain. But it's not at a single point. There's an entire circle here where you can wander around. You go to the top of the mountain, it's flat. You can wander around in that circle. Your algorithm may move you from one point here to another point here to another point here to another point here. It can keep going on in circles forever, almost forever. The likelihood doesn't really change, but the parameter values do change. So to be safe, I mean, if you, if you tracked the parameter values, you, wouldn't, you would not stop. You would not know it's time to stop. So the safest thing is to track the likelihood. In practice, it doesn't really happen much. People track the parameter values. Um, the form I gave you of the EM algorithm, the one that says write down the expression if you knew the values of the Z's and then replace them, replace each Z by its expectation, works for most cases. Most cases of the EM algorithm. It works whenever the likelihood function falls into a family we call the exponential family, which is a very broad family of likelihood or of probability distributions that encompass pretty much every distribution you know. Gaussians, multinomials, uh, beta distributions, Dirichlet, all of them are part of the exponential family. But not all distributions fall in, the, in, in this family, and when they don't, this will not work. Let me tell you when, when this works. This works when the likelihood is such that the log of the likelihood is linear in disease. Okay? The log of the likelihood is linear in those z, in those latent variables. In which case, um, substituting the expectation of the z's for the real z's will lead to the correct EM algorithm. I want to show you in the few minutes I have uh, the general form of the EM algorithm that does not make this assumption. You may not see the relationship directly, but I want you to see it because you may see it somewhere else. I want you to be familiar with it. The general formulation for the M algorithm says that you have some uh, observed data, which we call X. Uh, this stands for a lot of values, okay? N in our case. So it's a, it's a, it's a vector of values. And parallel to it, there is a vector of unobserved data. This could be the data that your dog ate, or this could be the result of some intermediate steps that you were not told about, or you were not able to observe, like the flipping of a coin before you draw from a Gaussian. Um, sometimes we take the two together and we call them Y, and this goes by the name of complete data.
Complete data, observed data, unobserved data, or latent data. Our goal is to derive maximum likelihood estimate, which is the maximum likelihood over all the parameters of the likelihood of the visible data. This is the normal maximum likelihood condition. The data we see, the data we have. But the data we see is actually easier to write as a joint distribution over the visible, the observed, and the unobserved, summed over the unobserved. If we could solve this directly, that's fine. We don't need to go through EM. But the problem is we usually don't. We usually have to express this likelihood in terms of something that we don't know. And then we have to sum over all the cases we don't know. The problem with this is that we don't know how likely different values of Z are. Right? I mean, suppose you could sum over all of these. This is equivalent to summing over all possible combinations of every number came from, you know, the coin, you know, the coin was flipped n times. There were two to the n possible outcomes. It's summing over all these two to the n possibilities. Let's suppose we do that. It's exponential, but let's suppose we do that. We still don't know how likely each one is because it, it depends not only on the observed value of x, but also on the parameters, and we don't know the parameters. This is where the, pro the problem comes from. Here's the AM solution. We write the log, I'll call it just log here, of the joint probability of x and z, condition on theta. And because we don't know the probability of z, we're going to take the expectation of z conditioned on the current value of the parameters and on the data. So this is, we don't know what the distribution of z values is because it depends on these two and we don't know this one. So we will assume some tentative value of this one and we will calculate an expected value of z. And then we will take the argmax here over theta and this becomes our theta L plus one. This is the entire EM algorithm in its most general form. And I want to point out something that can be confusing. There is theta here twice. These are not the same theta. Well, they, they both have bar. This is a fixed value. This is our tentative value, the value we start with in iteration L. This is a free variable that gets maximized over. And whatever gets maximized over becomes the next value. This part, the conditioning, is the conditioning of the expectation. And it's conditioning for the purpose of expectation over z. Remember, whenever you see the expectation sign, stop and say, do I know what is this over? This is expectation over what variable? And under what distribution? In this case, the expectation is over the variable z and under the distribution that assumes this value of the parameters. When we did this calculation over there of the fractions, we were basically calculating this expectation of z. Questions? Yeah. Why are you doing different? That's for the um, yes, I'm not doing anything differently. The example I gave is an example of this, but because the example I gave has the form, a very general form, that when you take the log of the likelihood, you get something that is linear in Z, then this expectation can be pushed in to everywhere Z is present, it's replaced by expectation of Z. In the general case, it cannot be pushed in. You have to solve it, whatever it is. Let me stop here and introduce our guest. 
I'm very lucky to be visited by Dr. Uh, Michael Horrell from uh, Uptake Technologies. Uh, Uptake Technology is a um, um, machine learning company in Chicago uh, that um, I don't know, you may have heard that they've recently given us, uh, uh, helped us establish the fund. They gave us a gift to establish a fund for machine learning for social good. So they're a very socially minded company. Um, they have an entire um, division, subsidiary, whatever. Used to be called Beyond Uptake, now it's called uptake.org. Oh, that's right. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that deals with applying machine learning for, for social good, for social causes. Um, Michael is going to talk about their real work where they make their money. Um, so I thought it would be, I asked him to talk to you for a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the kind of machine learning problems they encounter in industry and uh, he may be available to both take care questions and meet with people uh, if you're interested in meeting with him. Michael is a PhD in statistics from the University of Chicago and thank you for coming. I'll thank plug you. you in. Yeah, I gotta plug you in. Yeah, I, I got it warm for you, so. Uh, HDMI good? Yeah, it should be good. Here. On the side. Set up? I think so. Alright, cool. Try to turn down the lights. Uh, here are your lights. Um. Alright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good enough. Okay, cool. Okay, sure. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, as Roni mentioned, uh, I come from, uh, or I work at it's a company, co company called Uptake. Uh, what I do there is manage part of the data science team. Um, and my goal here today is to show you guys what we work on, what we think about when we are trying to solve uh, these machine learning problems uh, with the goal of you know, applying them to, to, uh, to industry. Um, I put my email up here. Uh, as Ronnie mentioned, I'll be around uh, until about 4 o'clock today. I'm happy to meet with people if you're curious a little bit more about uptake, um, or you can reach out by email as well. All right, so I'll be talking about a little bit about a little bit more about what we do at uptake, um, and then I'll and then that'll be pretty quick. Then I'll dive into the exact problems that we work on, as well as the approaches we bring to those problems, and then the challenges we encounter there. And this should take about 15 minutes, which should leave good time for questions at the end as well. So if you have any questions along the way. Um, Feel free to ask them, but also know that you'll have a lot of time at the end to ask them as well. All right. So as Roni mentioned, my background is in statistics. I got my PhD in statistics from the University of Chicago. Um, and I am a data science lead at Uptake. And as I mentioned, that basically means that I manage a chunk of the data science team. Um, Uptake itself was founded in 2014. Um, we are an industrial data analytics company. Basically what that means is uh, we try to <clears throat> analyze data that comes off of machines that work in heavy industry so we can try to make those machines more efficient, more safe, more productive overall. Um, and then on the right there we have a couple of the headlines we've generated along the way um, that we're pretty excited about and that's again in about three years. Uh, the, the, the age of the company is about three years so, so I think we've kind of generated a pretty big splash there. Um, all right, so rather than, so the, the types of problems we work on at Uptake, rather than try to give you a definition of those, I figured it'd be more interesting to go through an example. Um, the example here is, is a mining supply chain. So if you think about what do we do in mining, uh, first the material is taken out of the ground and it's taken to a processing plant that plant processes it, processes that material, and then we take it to a refining plant that will refine it, and then along the way we transport that material either to customers or in between these different plants. 
So in each one of these stages, we have these big machines working to either haul this material or process the material. Um, and these big machines have to, they're either operated by humans or operated automatically. Uh, and these machines have to work together. And so we think that kind of the, the big opportunity for analytics here is to make sure that, that each one of those machines individually you know, is as efficient and safe as possible. And then two, since these machines are working together, this is one big network, how can we optimize that whole network to increase efficiency for this whole network? Um, and so, you, so, uh, so that's kind of where we think analytics fits in here. And as, since this is, you know, really big industry, um, you know, you can imagine that even a 1% increase in efficiency here translates to a ton of value for these customers. <clears throat> Kind of high level what we think about when we uh, are going to a new area, we're thinking about the analytics we're going to bring to that area. Uh, there's a couple different questions and there's different complexity uh, associated with these questions, but first is how am I doing? This more or less equates to some basic dashboarding of the, of the data that we have available, available on these machines. So where's my machine? How much payload does it have? Um, if you do that really, really well, that's actually a ton of value right there, especially if, if we go to a customer that has no visibility in how they're doing it, it, just getting a little bit of visibility there is super valuable. Next, kind of on the, on the value chain here is, well, how will I do? Uh, and this is about trying to figure out whether or not your machine individually will fail. So if I'm, you know, if, I, if I'm monitoring a mining truck here on the left and I say, okay, within the next week, this machine is going to fail. You need to do something. Otherwise, it's, it, it kind of will fail on, on the haul road. <clears throat> this allows the operator of that machine or the, or the manager of that mine site to uh, schedule maintenance for that machine. And that's kind of one of the main levers of value that we drive by producing these analytics. If we can change uh, unplanned downtime events to planned downtime events, then <clears throat> then the potential downtime there will have less potential to affect the rest of the parts of the network there. So that's kind of one of our missions is to change unplanned downtime into downtime. And you, you can kind of think about that as well. Let's say you have a car. You don't want to wait until the thing breaks down on the road. You want to be able to take it to the shop um, uh, preemptively so that your time isn't wasted, uh, and potentially the, the, the cost of that repair is also less than it might be if it, if it breaks down on the road. So that's kind of how will, I, how, how will I do. That's the predictive modeling side. And then the last part here is, is optimization, and, that, and that's kind of what I mentioned about these machines operate within a network. Well, OK, it's great if I can optimize my single machine, but how do I optimize this team of machines? So let's say I know five machines are going to go down this week and then in the next two weeks, how can I properly schedule that maintenance so that it has the least effect on my overall network? So that's kind of high level of the types of problems we think about and try to solve at uptake. Um, I'll be focusing on, I'll be focusing on uh, asset main, problems of asset maintenance, um, basically trying to prevent single machines from failing. And before I get into the, those, those methods, I'll present a little bit of the theory here. Um, so let's say I have a component on a machine. And let's say I kind of fairly abstractly, I, I'm able to monitor the performance of that component by this, by this blue line. And so it's, this per component is performing well. Then all of a sudden, its performance degrades. If it degrades enough, it hits a safety threshold where the machine should stop. Um, if, if the operators continue to use that machine, that component's eventually going to break, um, and that's kind of, the, kind of a, a hard failure threshold where the machine is no longer operable because this component has broken. Um, and our goal is to detect the failing component as soon as we possibly can, and the reason why we want to detect it early, it's kind of described by this green line here at the bottom, just the cost of, the cost of, uh, fixing those components, um, <clears throat> cost of fixing those components becomes more expensive as that failure progresses. And so you can think, well, sure, maybe I need to just tighten a screw at the beginning as opposed to, well, the component fell off my machine and now I'm in serious trouble. So, so 
<clears throat> detecting things early is, is less costly, and you can also plan for those fixes. All right. So I, I present a couple different high-level approaches here. Our preferred approach, perhaps unsurprisingly, is, is a machine learning type of approach. That's, on, that's the third column there. Um, not sure why it's progressing on its own here. Uh, so that, that's where we think most of the, uh, that's where we think we can solve a lot of these problems the, in, in, in the best way is. Uh, and just a, a high level description here is we're trying to link the sensor data that comes off those machines. These machines have hundreds of sensors on them. We're trying to link that sensor data to fix information or failure information so that we can identify when those scenarios exist and we can you know, alert the right people and, ho and hopefully they can get those machines to the shops um, in a timely manner to prevent those severe failures. Um, there are, so we're not the first company to try to do that. So there are other methods out there, but again, we think this is the most promising uh, approach to these problems. So I'll talk about these other methods here. So the first method on the left here is what we kind of call a knowledge-based model. Um, so engineers build these machines. They know the rough tolerances that, that these components can <clears throat> withstand. And so maybe they'll build some simple rules or some simple you know, if-then statements that say, well, if this temperature exceeds this threshold, then we'll call that a failure, then we need to take it to the shop. These things are, I mean, super useful, super interpretable. Uh, the, the issue with, with, with that solution, though, is kind of the scalability of that issue. You know, the engineer, I mean, they're, they're experts uh, at that machine, but there's only so many of them, and these machines operate in lots of different scenarios. And while, while these are great models, they might only be useful to, for detecting kind of critical, critical items, which means that we're detecting failure maybe further down this graph than we'd like to, and so we'd like to detect failure a little bit earlier. <clears throat> uh, life expectancy models, I won't talk too much about this, but these are essentially, essentially actuarial tables for components. So air filters might last 1,000 hours. I'm at my 900th hour. You know, maybe I want to replace that air filter. Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, so I might want to replace that air filter because I know it's at 900 hours and things usually last 1,000 hours. Um, but that might not be, you know, if my air filter is fine, why do I need to replace it? So that one's not super useful for, for what we're trying to do. And then physical models, we could think about, people will build physical uh, simulations of the processes of, of these machines. Um, and we can think of these as really just knowledge-based models, but enhanced or beefed up. And, and kind of the similar issue there is the scalability. Not only do you need your engineers to tell you how the machine was built, but you need those engineers to also build physical simulations. It's just hard to do that for every machine out there, for every possible scenario, um, which is why we land on these more machine learning types of methods. Um, <clears throat> so now that I've said that machine learning is, we think, the way to solve a lot of these problems, let me just talk about kind of the challenges to doing that. So one of the main challenges that we have is that, well, I, I mentioned that the machine learning approach here, we try to relate sensor signal data to failure information. So that means that we need, we, uh, we need to have sensor signal data as well as that failure information. Unfortunately, failure information can be pretty rare. Well, can be pretty unreliable. Failures like severe failure, failures are also pretty rare, which is a good thing for the, for the operators of those machines, um, but it's not good if you're trying to build the best model out there. Um, so yeah, so they can be pretty rare, they can be pretty inconsistent. Maybe a little data point that, that supports, supports that conclusion is that our main, our single source of failure information is the mechanic, and the mechanic's job is not actually to record data for our use, his, his job is to fix the machine. Um, and sometimes that's done in an inconsistent way. Uh, it's not, okay, I'm not gonna throw the mechanic completely under the bus here. So there's, there's other processes in place that make failure information unreliable. Um, and an, an ex another example of this is some mining operations, they, op they wanna operate almost 24 hours a day. And to do that, they often replace things preemptively. So they'll replace things that don't need to be replaced. <clears throat> and so that throws, you know, 
we'll get a bunch of failure information and realize, well, you know, sometimes half of it might not be usable because that part actually wasn't failing. Um, that uh, represents a great opportunity for us, but it also makes the modeling a little bit difficult. Um, so I'll talk briefly about one, one thing we do to get around this. Uh, we, try to tr we try to do transfer learning. learning. Um, and I don't know if this would meet an academic definition of transfer learning, but basically we want to learn as much as we can in one area and take our learning, uh, learnings from there and take it to a new scenario. And so a small example of this is let's say I learn how tires work by analyzing data coming off of mining trucks. I can use those learnings uh, to take it to, say, some new application airplanes where maybe I don't have as much data. And I can get up and running with a tire model um, more quickly than I could if I needed to wait for, for a bunch of data to be collected from those airplanes. Now, there's different ways to do this. There's completely manual ways to do this, where we just learn how tires work and we build a new model. Um, that's not scalable as well. So, so there's different things that we do to, to try to get this to happen. Kind of a, a really, really simple example of this is maybe not the tire, tire failure model, but like if I'm using, it, say, a convolutional neural network, often in, in kind of image analytics, those base layers learn really useful features, really useful filters. Um, so instead of training a completely new network on a completely new data set, I'm going to just use those filters or, or trained features again. I'll chop off the top of that network and I'll retrain a new network, but, but one that's starting in a pretty good place. Um, so that's kind of one version of transfer learning as we see it. Um, but there's lots of different ways to go about this. Now, I think in the interest of time, <clears throat> I'll, go, I'll go over these next challenges. I might skip one of these challenges. But uh, so the second challenge we, we encounter is one of, again, we need that sensor data. That's, that's the second part of this. We need the failure data. Now we need the sensor data. Um, sensor data uh, is, can also itself be inconsistent. Um, and, and that might not be terribly interesting. You know, sensors stop working every now and again. Usually that's not a big deal. Um, where this becomes a bigger deal is when we are missing data in critical scenarios. So a locomotive could operate in the mountains. The, uh, you know, it's, it's probably push, pushing itself a lot harder in the mountains. And also the cellular, cellular network that that locomotive connects to might also be not as connective. So, <clears throat> Uh, that's a case where we're not gathering data in a fairly critical scenario. And I'll, I'll skip this item here. The, the other kind of challenge that we have is that these machines have tons of sensors on them. So there's a lot, a lot of data out there that we need to analyze. And moreover, a lot of it is, not, is sometimes not all that relevant. So a brief example of this is one of the first things I actually did at Uptake was delete a whole bunch of data because we had been collecting, uh, or we just had on hand, um, like by the second data about whether or not a machine had its headlights on. You know, that I, after looking at it for some time, I realized, okay, that's not actually gonna be terribly useful for the uh, purposes of figuring out whether or not the engine is breaking and stuff like that. So there's a lot of data out there, not all of it's relevant, and you have to summarize a ton of data. So kind of that combined with the fact that our failure information can also be pretty rare, makes this a, a pretty difficult problem. And so I will say that the way, so those challenges exist, that's what, what we do deal with on the, on the day to day. I think, and, and those challenges exist kind of for a lot of these other methods as well. I think another reason why these approaching this from a machine learning perspective, or rather I'll say how we, how, we, how we address those challenges is we aggressively pursue the data that helps us uh, get around some of those challenges. And because we're using more of a machine learning technique, we are better able to incorporate those disparate data sources. Whereas a knowledge-based model where an engineer builds a model, they are probably not gonna be able to incorporate all these different data sources effectively same thing is true with the life expectancy models as well as, the, uh, as, well as potentially these physical models as well. Um, 
So I had, I'll go over this, uh, I have one really brief example here. Uh, this will be the last slide. But basically, so let's say I'm monitoring this locomotive, I have these temperature sensors uh, that I've been monitoring, and then I see, okay, these temperatures have spiked. To me, that means that a failure has occurred, and because of the way it has spiked, I know that it's a fan failure that's occurred. So this is a pretty simple example that you could find with, with those knowledge-based models. But where this becomes more complex is when you start to think about, well, I need, to, I need to understand the pattern of this failure. So because these things have jumped up immediately, I know that's a fan failure. But there are other things that cause the coolant and the oil temperatures to rise. Um, and maybe those other causes could, could be due to other mechanical failures or sensor failure. So that's where this problem becomes, kind of starts at something which does seem pretty simple to something, and it becomes something a little bit more nuanced, which is why you want to get away from those knowledge-based, rule-based methods, which can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. All right. Um, so that's high level what we do at Uptake. Those are kind of the approaches we take, the challenges we have. My email is, is right here. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. Also, as I said, I'm around for the next few hours later today. So if you just want to meet and chat, I'm happy to do that too.